Hey everyone, before we dive into this video, I want to give a quick shout out and some love to our good friends over at Sneak. If you haven't heard, Sneak is hosting a free Capture the Flag, or what they're calling a Fetch the Flag, on October 5th. The CTF is for beginners to intermediate players, and I've actually included a couple of my own original old school vintage challenges. There will be 20 challenges in total, including a few that I created. Some of my own favorites are Hot Dog, Tack Stack, and Magician. You might have seen those before, but they will be a lot of fun, and I'm happy to include them in the mix. So hey, if you win, in addition to the glory and bragging rights that you can take home, you can win some awesome prizes, including a Nintendo Switch. It's all totally free, it's all online, and you can register right now with the link in the description below. You're going to have my little tag in there, sneak.co slash john. And take a look, have some fun, it should be a great game, it's going to be beginner friendly and welcoming to just about all players and levels of expertise. Solve some challenges, learn some cool new things, and I'm going to be doing write-ups, of course. I'm going to be showcasing some video write-ups and solutions after the capture the flag, but if you want to get the most out of it, you should totally jump in, go play, and try your hand yourself. The CTF kicks off the very first day of SneakCon, SneakCon's conference on building securely. So participating in the CTF on October 5th, and then stick around on October 6th and 7th for 100 sessions and more, all including some live hacking workshops. Totally free, all online, virtual. You can register right now. Link in the description below. And I hope to see you there. Hope to see you on the scoreboard, and I hope to see you soon. In this video, we are doing some more malware analysis. I'm super excited to bring this to you. I think this is a really cool sample. There's a lot to it. It does a lot of really weird, really neat stuff. So, without further ado, let's dive right in. I'll hop over to my computer screen here. I am running Ubuntu Linux. I should be running Remnux, like all the cool kids, the reverse engineering and malware analysis Linux distribution. However, I am just a poor boy, just a scrub, just a skitty, just a noob. Anyway, I'm in this edge directory in my Linux terminal terminal here. Uh, I'm running Z shell, I'm running ZSH, um, and I actually have the syntax highlighting plugin and stuff installed so that all the words and things that I type in can be displayed nice out and beautifully. And I'm running uh, exa as an alias or replacement for my ls command, so I have a nice display here. Anyway, I have this file. I have this file called edgeupdate.ps1, and this is where our story will begin. So, you can see by the file extension, right, you might already be able to tell we're working with a .ps1 file, which is a Windows PowerShell script. I'm running on Linux just to do the analysis. This would, of course, be malware and stuff that would actually execute or detonate on a Windows victim or Windows target. The file name here is kind of peculiar, Edge Update. I'm going to assume that's referring to Microsoft Edge, right? Their new modern web browser to kind of bring forth Internet Explorer, etc., and, and just amp that up. But it's really not going to be an edge update uh, script. This was found, by the way, in a user's home directory or their user profile. I think it actually is just like C user public. That was where we ended up tracking this thing down. So may very well be executed and set up. But we could dig into it and really see what's up here. I'm going to open up Sublime Text as my text editor of choice. You could certainly use whatever text editor you might like. I don't know if you're a Vim fanboy or you like Nano or you like Emacs or you want to start the holy wars between Vim and Emacs or VS Code if you're that kind of human being. Uh, this is what we're looking at. Though, this is edgeupdate.ps1. So, looks pretty suspicious right off the bat, right? <laughs> We've got a couple add type commandlets, which will uh, essentially end up kind of compiling a, and bringing in the context of certain libraries within Windows, right? And you might see these oftentimes when you're using a, a using statement in C Sharp or just doing anything where you might want to pick and choose, cherry pick the good stuff from within Windows while you're building out a program or doing specific things. So oftentimes you might use this also for kind of compiling your own C Sharp to be able to use and execute within PowerShell, and power up PowerShell, make it do some pretty super stuff with Win32 API calls and the other things that could be done. Uh, but add type will leave behind some artifacts. Um, if you haven't checked it out, add type will end up funneling way in the background to call CSC or the C Sharp compiler, CSC.exe, and that will leave temporary files on disk. It will leave behind artifacts, and I believe the temp directory or the, the user's temporary directory in that environment variable expanded out of like a strange random string .0 .cs or .out or .error, etc. Um, 
It's just kind of a momentary thing, but it does end up creating that. Anyway, for the sake of what we're doing here, we don't need to uh, dig into all that. We just know that this script is going to load in some stuff from System Windows Forms, Microsoft Visual Basic, Microsoft C Sharp, System Management, and System Web. Don't need to exactly care about that right away. We can sort of press the I Believe button on that. But we have a weird uh, array of bytes. You can see this is defined a, a type here, uh, dollar sign to denote a variable in PowerShell run PE is the name of our variable, uh, which we could assume <laughs> might be a runnable executable, right? A, a PE file, a portable executable, like a windows.exe file or a .dll. Could be spicy. There could be some interesting stuff in here. Uh, and this is all compressed, put together in on one line. Uh, if I were to scroll for a long, long time, you could see that my horizontal scroll bar goes for a while. Uh, and there's probably some more stuff to view later down in the code. But if I were to actually turn on word wrap, we could see that this is a pretty hefty chunk of bytes. Now, if you couldn't tell, all of these bytes are represented in just decimal numbers, right? We don't have any A through F. We don't have any oddballs that might indicate this is hexadecimal or octal or any other weird representation. These are all using the digits 0 through 9 being base 10 or decimal. And it looks like just about all of these numbers are going to end up being less than 255. So that tells me these could very well just be ASCII character codes or, or represented in, in that decimal format. So you could use things like CyberChef to go ahead and uh, like get the actual representation of this as bytes as a raw file. If you want to do that, you very well could. However, we should probably be a little bit smarter because maybe we could get a little bit more uh, juice out of this. Let's create our own Python script. I'll do this in Python. I'll use carver.py as my file name. And let's just try and carve out those bytes and understand what they might be. So I'm going to end up using this array and I'll define that here and paste in all of those bytes in that disgusting way. <laughs> the sublack plugin or the black linter for Python is going to end up uh, wanting to clean that. Let me turn that off for this window. There we go. And what we could do is we could actually get a byte array of this array, right? So if I were to print this out, I'll hop back over to my terminal momentarily. And now I can, oh, now I can Python 3 that carver.python script. There we go. Now we have all of the bytes represented from what that uh, file would have been or what it is in that run PE variable. Let's go ahead and write that to a file. Let's use a with open. So we have a context manager. We'll call it run PE, I guess, dot bytes. Uh, and then we'll use WB. And I should be using double quotes here because I don't have sublack on uh We'll call that h for handle, and we'll use h.write, and that will automatically close it for us, thankfully, so we don't need to do that because we are using our context manager. And nice and easy, we just have some stupid, crappy Python code that will write this out to a file, and there's no output anymore, but we now have this run pe.bytes file present. I could go ahead and use the file command on that to do a little simple reconnaissance, see if there's anything actually interesting or worthwhile in the magic bytes or the header or the file signature of that file. And it actually does tell me, hey, yeah, this is a gzip compressed data, max speed from fat file system, Microsoft DOS, blah, blah, blah. Nice. Okay. We could gunzip that if we really wanted to. Uh, if you wanted to gunzip that or g unzip, right? If it is gzip compressed on Linux, we can just simply use the gunzip utility, but it will require that that file that you're trying to gunzip has a traditional and classic gz extension. Uh, so let's go ahead and move that run pe.bytes to run pe.bytes.gz, I suppose. Now I could simply gunzip run pe.bytes.gz, and no output, it has succeeded, however, and now I have a smaller file of run pe.bytes. Checking out what that could be, ooh, we have some source code, allegedly C++ source code. Uh, that I don't think we've seen in a malware analysis video, so we can have some fun with that. Uh, before we do though, let's, uh, before we dive into that, let's continue moving through our original edge update.ps1 script to see what else could be going on here. Looks like I see a function being defined called install, and this has a string variable created as a VBS run name, uh, and it uses system text encoding default get string from a yet again ASCII bytes. 
So we could track down what that really is or what that might be doing. Um, we could basically use our same little script here. We could just say, what is it? We call that VBS run. And that's going to be an array yet again. So I'll add the uh, opening and closing square braces. And then rather than writing uh, run pe.bytes, let's make that file name. I'm just commenting these out here in Python. Let's make that file name vbs run dot bytes. And we could write it. Variable is now called vbs run. Theoretically, that should work. Let's get back to our terminal yet again, run Python carver. New output here. Now we have vbs run dot bytes with a file size of 116 bytes. Let's check out what that content is there. It sounds like it would be a Visual Basic script or a VBS file, and it is. <laughs> so what this is doing, creating a simple object to represent wscript.shell, which gives us a little bit more power when we're working with uh, scripting languages like Visual Basic Script or JScript or some of those kind of classic vanilla um, Windows, Microsoft Windows scripting engines. And it tries to run a command out of this wscript.shell. That's what that function will allow us to do. Looks like it runs PowerShell mm -hmm, with an execution policy of remote signed, which is interesting. I would normally have expected to see like bypass or unrestricted. Uh, and it specifies a file and then concatenates with an ampersand. You can see these strings here uh, are just going to be added together, but it also is going to add in the file path file path being something uh, that looks like a DOS variable represented by the percent signs around it. That sounds like it could very well be like a DOS thing, but maybe it's used elsewhere. Uh, and then it has a zero as another argument for this run call to hide the window or never actually display a window for that. So that is a small, small snippet of Visual Basic script code, but what are they gonna end up doing with that? You can see right after that string is defined there, we go ahead and write all text to a system environment get folder path seven. Uh, okay. And then adding a backslash to get another subdirectory or folder thing. And it looks like the file name is system login windows 32 bit system dot VPS. <laughs> really good name, guys. Really, uh, Really hiding that one, blending it in with camouflage right there. Uh, however, it looks like it does do a little replace on that file path, and then it refers to PS command path. Now, PS command path would refer to, I believe, the currently running script. Uh, and we can experiment with that. Let's try and get a Windows VM set up where I could uh, tinker with that. So I have a Windows VM set up and accessible here. Um, I believe I could just fire up PowerShell and we've got this open and displayed here. So that uh, syntax that we're using as the location to write this is using system environment get folder path number seven. Let's go ahead and see what that evaluates to within PowerShell on a natural Windows system. I'll simply paste that in and it looks like it's spitting it into my current users application data roaming Windows like start menu startup okay <laughs> so that will end up executing uh or, or dropping this visual basic script into the startup directory or the startup folder that will mean it will automatically run uh when machine starts up right once you log in so that tells us it's a little bit of persistence there a little bit of a little mechanism where that malware could continue to run or actually execute and uh if that's what that install function is truly doing, looks like it's going to end up running a PowerShell script. What could our PS command path variable really be? Uh, yet again, we'll hop back over to Windows, try and paste that in. Uh, looks like I copied that wrong. PS command path. Uh, now, because this is not a script, I don't believe that is actually going to be displaying something. Let's echo out the command path uh, as a PS1 script, and let's try and run that Oh, goodness. I am ruining everything. Uh, we want dot slash test dot PS1. And now it will return and display out the path to that script. So it truly is adding persistence to go ahead and run itself. The, yet again, the original edge update dot PS1 file. Gotcha. 
Moving on from the install function, now that we've kind of wrapped that up, let's go check out what else is happening here. We have this decompress function. Uh, and this looks like a little boilerplate thing to take in a byte array parameter or argument and then create a memory stream object with that included and decompress it with gzip. Uh, copies that out, returns it, closes the memory stream, etc. cetera. Uh, so this looks like just kind of a, a convenience function for decompressing gzip data, which is exactly what we did a moment ago in Linux when we were on the command line in the terminal and we said, hey, let's gunzip that runpe.bytes.gz file. So it looks like they're kind of encapsulating that same functionality just in a nice little nickname. So they could use that later on in their script. Ooh, and then we have a, a huge mess here. <laughs> This is a new function they're defining after we close out of the decompress function above. This is called code DOM, I, I guess. Takes in a dollar sign BB argument, a dollar sign TP, a dollar sign MT, some as bytes, the others as strings, but this does not have uh, some good natural indentation. So, oh goodness, there's a lot of crap there. Uh, let, let's figure out what this is doing, right? We have bytes that could be passed in. Let's rename that. Uh, we'll call that um, uh, argument bytes, I guess. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, I don't know what TP is going to end up being, but seemingly a string. Anyway, we create a dictionary with a new object, system collection generic dictionary, mapping as a string as a string. Okay. And we add a compiler version, version 4.0. This seems very .NET like with a v4.0 uh creating a c sharp code provider yep creating compiler parameters we're adding referenced assemblies that we might end up using i see system dll system management dll system windows forms etc etc so these are things that would be included for compiling something there's a parameter added to include debug information. We set that to false, so we will not include any symbols or things. Uh, generate executable is set to false. So arguably it won't write to disk, perhaps. Uh, generate in memory is set to true, which makes me think that it will end up, you know, generating it in memory and not writing to disk. Uh, the compiler options that it adds on here, looks like it adds an x86 platform flag, uh, slash unsafe, and slash target library. I feel like we could Google some of those if we wanted to, get a little bit more uh, know-how on what that slash unsafe perimeter and flag does. But I think with slash target library, does that make it a DLL rather than an, an EXE on its own? We'll have to experiment with some of the code that we see later on because it it takes the argument bytes that was passed in and then decompresses it with gzip as we just saw above. Um, then we have the compiler results pulled out after we compile assembly from source, being the compiler mem uh, parameters all created above and then the get string of our argument bytes that we would have passed in. Mm. So the type t is going to be our compiler Results, compiled assembly, get type, dollar sign P. I have to think that that uh, is a type to run or work with. Uh, regardless, we have a byte bytes thing in a disgusting decompress of system web, HTTP utility, URL decode to bytes, in which case we have all of this nonsense. And you could probably clearly tell a lot of this is URL encoded, right? Even just from reading that line, but the percent syntax here every now and again with just two bytes or, or just two representations in hex, that is the telltale sign for URL encoding. A lot of these, you can see a couple per, uh, like per parentheses and plus signs and underscores and exclamation points. Those aren't, it looks like, going to end up being URL encoding, but we could carve out the rest of it anyway. Uh, let's go ahead and, and do that. Let's take this entire chunk. Ooh, goodbye, bitrate <laughs> on YouTube. And uh, let's try and decompress this. We'll, we'll have Carver do this yet again as our nice little Swiss army knife. Let's say URL data can be a big long string of all of that. And I believe the, what is it? URL lib dot parse, I think. Let's not display that out, but let's just actually, let's not write it to a file. Let's use URL lib dot parse dot, I think it's unquote 
to take it out of the URL data. And let's see what that gives us. Let's do a Python 3 carver real quick. Oh, and we have a lot of bytes. Um, let's call that URL data bytes. Remove that last parentheses there. And then we will do one more write. And I guess we can call that what? What really did this come from? Bytes? I, code dom dot bytes? I guess that's fine. And we want to call that and run with the URL data bytes. Let's see how that looks. We don't really need to comment out those other ones. But if I run this, oh, string argument without an encoding. Can I tell you to make that UTF-8? That did it. Okay, so all I needed was to pass in another argument to byte array. We'll tell it UTF-8 as a normal, sane, uh, actual encoding. And we have code dom dot bytes, which is just data at the moment. Uh, what does it look like? Can I hex edit that? Hmm. Part of me wonders if I did that right. They do end up decompressing this. So that should have been a GZ, would it not? That should have ended up being a gunzip file. Considering what that was telling us to do. Maybe we don't need to uh, use it as bytes? Or, hmm. Maybe not a byte array, but dot encode of UTF-8. We'll just experiment, we'll just explore for a little bit. Still data. What if we just took that as a string? Would it complain? Still data. Let's try and do this with a stupid, crappy, maybe, could we, could we just run, like, gunzip on that, maybe? If we check out the bytes there, if we were to go back to the original one, we do have 1F, EF, BF, BD, and it starts with 1F, 8B, 0, 8, 0, 0. So that is wrong. Let's try and go back to how we did it previously. Let's use the byte array of UTF-8. I didn't actually check the... Display there, 1F, EF, BF, that's wrong. Just straight wrong. Is unquote doing it the way that I think it is? It was getting bytes out of it. Or maybe I'm using the wrong encoding there. Sorry, this is just a little bit of a tiptoe tap dancing. Can encode character, I don't care. Um, let's go back to that method. 1FEF is still not giving me the love. All right, let's, uh, for the sake of moving on, let's go do uh, some quick Cyber Chef. We'll cheat. How about that? I know you guys won't mind. At least I hope you guys don't mind. <laughs> it is truly you being the judge. So uh, let's do a URL decode right there. And now we have all this data. Let me yoink this. I'll actually call that a download.dat and try to bring it to this directory. And let's see if now you think it's a gzip data. Yep, okay. I must have just been doing it wrong like an idiot. Uh, as I said, though, uh, with CyberChef, you could just do a gun zip. And previously, you could have used the uh, from character code. Uh, and that would help you decode those things. Correct. Okay. With that done, we actually have our download.dat being a code dom.bytes.gz. So let me go ahead and get rid of code dom dot bytes because it's going to want to clobber that when I use code dom dot bytes dot gz with my gun zip command. Let's unzip that. And now we have code dom dot bytes, which is a PE32 executable uh, Intel 8386 mono dot net assembly. Nice. Because this is a .NET assembly, we have a little bit more runway. We could open this thing up in like ILSpy or DNSpy or uh, .peek or any other tool that you might like. But that is one thing that we could continue on with once we're done <laughs> scrolling through this .ps1 file. I promise we are just about at the end. Uh, let me kill the bitrate real quick, just cruising to the very, very bottom. So after the code uh, 
looks like this try statement should actually still be inside of the code DOM function call. But then we try to do something. We try to take my PT as a system IO path combine the runtime directory. Does that mean like the current location? Does that mean that I, I have to feel like that is the current path? Let's check that out in, oh, actually no. It is C Windows Microsoft.NET Framework. So it being the .NET uh, compiler location. That makes a little bit more sense to me because it is the runtime environment, runtime directory, and it will try to slap in an app launch.exe right there. It'll try to allegedly compile that because that's not going to actually have an app launch.exe directory, will it not? Or file in there? Oh goodness, a lot of stuff. Let's cat this out just to see, or let's run a DIR LS in here. I don't know if they have an app launch.exe at the very, very top here. They do. They do have an app launch.exe. So that will just end up running it, it seems. So we will end up replacing from our MyPT file. And we replace framework 64 with framework, as in that it's not going to use a 64-bit rendition, it's going to use the 86, or excuse me, 32-bit, x86, uh, with the bytes that we would have decompressed. Okay. Then we return t of get method mt. So t was the type that we had above. Let's, let's, I... Let's turn word wrap off super quick because we've kind of already done all that analysis. Uh, type T is going to end up being the type that returns from this. And then we invoke, okay, so like creating the assembly in memory, invoking a method. Uh, params is going to end up being that being ran, I believe. Uh, what is MT coming from? MT is that... The method, oh, 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 okay, so down below, after we won the install function at our persistence, right, with the visual basic script, we sleep for a little bit of time, sure, just wait a little bit, then we run this code DOM function with this run PE original source code that was gzip compressed uh, and as an ASCII character code syntax that we just kind of carved it out. Uh, supposedly there is a projfud.pa Mm, namespace, I think that might be the right thing, and then execute to run that method. So if we were to execute, that is being actually invoked with the parameters, uh, but the parameters are referring to app launch.exe. So what is that going to end up doing? What does app launch.exe naturally do? Let's, uh, let's clear the screen here. PowerShell's stupid. I hate that I can't clear the screen nice and easy. Uh, if I were to try and check out what app launch.exe does, will you tell me? No. 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 Am I doing that wrong? <laughs> like, I did. That's just a string. Can I not run that? Uh, how about if we go there? I mean, I ain't afraid. I ain't scared. Let's do app launch.exe. You don't do anything, supposedly. Uh, let's ask Uncle Google. We got a, we don't have a Chrome browser open anymore. Let's Google. Hey, uh, app launch.exe, please. What do you do? What are you? Click once launch utility. Uh, yeah. All right, I don't know how much I trust file inspect library beta, um, but at least it's given me more info than I had before. File is part of Microsoft.NET Framework. Makes sense. App Launcher DXC is developed by Microsoft Corporation. It's a system and hidden file, usually located in a Windows subfolder and is usually that however many size. Creates new records in the Windows registry. Uh, you sure? Not a malware risk thing. It's a default thing. Uh, click once launch utility. Oh, 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 it does give you usage. App launch slash activate. 
Do you need an activate? Uh, it took a question mark. No, it didn't. Am I not running this the right way? Let's use the x86 one. Still nothing. Okay. Let's bail on that for the time being, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, virus total should be totally fine with it because it's not a virus. That's like natural, natural windows. Non-system processes like App Launch or DXC originate from software you installed on your system. What is the click once? It's called click once launch utility. Microsoft click once. Click once is a component of Microsoft.net work or whoa, framework 2.0 and later, and it supports deploying applications made with Windows Forms or Windows Presentation Foundation. That is interesting because we are including Windows Forms as some of the libraries that we pull in, right? So it's supposedly an application. Does it tell me a little bit about uh, App Launch? Jank. It's old. For Microsoft Framework, or the .NET Framework 2.0. Okay. You know what? Uh, I think we, again, can kind of hit the I believe button on that. Let's keep cruising with uh, what these things are now. Because... Theoretically, we have some source code that will be compiled, and we did see that we had source code here in our runpe.bytes. So let's take a gander at what this thing is. Uh, I'm going to assume this is C-sharp, yeah? So I set the syntax to that. And we do more disgusting obfuscation, I think. <laughs> anyway, we've got uh, some using statements, kind of as we discussed previously, that proj fud Fully undetectable, maybe? You think that's what they're thinking? Are they trying to be fully undetectable? Um, public static class PA. So that would have been the projfud.pa um, class. That's what it is. We take it out of the namespace there. And we have some convenience functions to find to reverse a string. Okay. We also have a binary to text where we excuse me, binary to string, where we would likely carve out binary data. And we have some delegates defined for different Win32 API calls that we might want to end up using. And it looks like we are pulling in runtime interop services, so maybe we do some of that cheeky stuff. Looks like all these delegates are created, but don't, uh, don't have a ton baked in, just the arguments so that we know how to use them when the time comes. With that said, we do have one disgusting <laughs> uh, convert to string thing with binary here. They split it on the pipe and then they take pieces of it with binary to string here. So I'm assuming we're just going to end up carving that out. Uh, let's do that uh, with our good friend Carver in Python. So let's do binary strings can equal this bad boy. And let's try and split that up the same way that they had. So let's do a binary strings dot split. Um, and we want to end up splitting actually by the pipe symbol, the same thing that they had used to, to split. Uh, so let's do a 4x in that, I suppose. And then let's actually go ahead and print out the x variable so we can see it. I'm just going to run this in sublime text with control B. There we have all of our binary. Now let's go ahead and convert that to an actual uh, message. I'll use int base 2 there. Uh, okay. And we actually are getting a new line at the very, very end because there's a, a trailing split. Totally fine. Uh, now we have all of this. We could unhexify that, I guess, or like from crypto util import these as, as long to bytes. We could do a couple different things. Let's let's just do the hat bin ASCII method, I suppose. Uh, import bin ASCII, sorry. So disgusting way. I, I Well, yeah. I'm going to get comments in the in the chat that are saying, John, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? 
you know you could have just done this thing and then that would have happened and then it would have been the way that I said and not the way that you did. <laughs> They're all reversed because we know that we have a uh, uh, the reverse function. So let's uh, reverse that nice and easy. There we go. Now we have all of these defined as uh, strings. So let's try and decode each of these. And now we have all of this. Um, realistically, if we wanted to put this in the um, code, we should probably add them as strings. Where did our freaking runp.bytes go? Oh, 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 sorry. I'm looking at it. So can I try this? If I were to uh, control shift L and then carve my way back out to all those and then paste it all in. Will that work? Yeah? Okay, cool. So multi-line cursors, literally just writing the string for the Win32 API that it wants. So that's kind of dumb, but it works. And they tried to hide it. They, hide it. they tried to hide those sensitive strings um, in the binary by using this method. So that will potentially get past some antivirus EDR solution crap. Um, just kind of slide under the radar by not having those literal strings in the executable that ends up being compiled. Because again, these like these variables aren't going to be maintained. They're not going to be retained through the compile process. Um, so we pull through all of the resume threads and we uh, are, are again reversing each of these. So we're able to do that. We kind of just did that naturally in creating that those variables. We aren't Let's not believe that they're calling reverse string anymore because we've done that for them just now. Um, and then we import some W uh, Win32 API function. We got load library, right? Cool. We also have get proc address being loaded in. And load API. I have not seen that used before. Do they do anything wacky to be able to use that? How do they get that into C Sharp? Is that a natural thing that it can do? I might just be dumb. Anywhere, uh, load API, create API are doing their thing. Then we have process information set up as structs so we could go ahead and run things. Yeah? Okay. And then we execute as the function that we're really calling. Was this all done in a constructor? Oh, no, no, no. These are all... These are convenient strings, or convenient function, reverse string, binary to string. And then you actually just end up calling all this code without being in a function. So it looks like it is allowing that to happen. Not being in a like constructor or anything weird like that. Whatever, cool. I'm good with that. I don't care. Uh, and then we have all this noise. So we're doing this five times, right? Int i, int less than five, increment, execute, bunch of stuff. Uh, we're creating new startup information, new process information. So we very likely will end up creating a actual uh, startup process or new process. It looks like we have some bytes that are being crafted here. Uh, int 32 and 2 in 64. Um, these just look like literal 2 in 32 and 2 in 64. <laughs> that I'm assuming that's what that hex ends up turning out to be. Like... I, I'm I'm saying that this is going to end up returning two in thirty two and two in sixty four as strings because these are string variables. But literally did that just above, so that's not all that helpful. Uh, and then we try to create process A based off of the path. The path is passed in as a in, as a argument to this function, which would be. Um, do we add parameters? No. Execute is going to end up running execute with parameters params, params being app launch. So is app launch going to end up creating something out of this, I think? Let's see what more we do here. Um, we have other binary shindigs going on this is going to end up being an n32 allegedly uh so let's see what that does in, in, in python here 
Can I just grab the code to print that out? Let's off of a binary string and we'll grab that binary string right here. Cool. So we're not going to be using the variable x anymore. We're using the variable binary string and that is invoke if we were to uh, have it reverse, but they did not reverse it. So that, that is just literally invoke. Um, so call by name, get method in 32, call type method. Uh, let's just replace that with invoke. So that that is calling a method with a payload, payload being passed in, uh, 30 times two. Um, I'm not positive what boilerplate thing that might need to be there for, like some parameters to actually execute a function just off the top of my head. Uh, let's see what this one does. Another binary string with a payload and file address. Hmm. Did I? I no, this this is just invoke yet again. It's the, that's the exact same string. So file address is going to invoke method z new object. Is that a typo? I think so. Probably hit that on accident. Um, what does that mean? Oh, are these like reaching into the segments of the file? Like image base, would that end up referring to like where it is in... A binary, maybe? I don't know. We do an if in pointer size is equal to four, that's gonna be checking for architecture. Uh, we'll throw a new exception if that is not a thing, in which case that means that is that. I'm trying to make sense of uh, these logic branches here, combing through those. Yeah. Okay, we do some wacky stuff here. We int ebx context 20 plus 21 base address. Then we read from process memory um, and then grab the image base base address. I'm just kind of cruising through this at this point. I don't know how much more we can pull out of here. Virtual alloc x to get carve out the image. Is this doing like process injection? because it's allocating memory in a different process, I think, yeah. Well, yeah. And then use try to write process memory. So it would fail if it didn't give a new image base. This has to be doing some process magic, some process voodoo that I just don't, I can't easily recognize right off the top of my head. Uh, but we are writing into some new stuff here. Get bytes to image base, write it, write it, write it. This is very, very likely going to be invoke again. Let's just try to, uh, yep, exact same invoke function. And we are just about at the end here where we run it binary to string resume thread so it's probably just going to end up actually executing letting the program go process get process by id convert to the dpi process id kill huh okay so let's go on the i believe button um that this will execute a thing and what we know is that there is a other thing for us to look at being the big boy of our bytes here, which would have been passed in to execute um, with app launch. Yeah, I think that's right. So that is our code dom dot bytes. Now that we've made sense of all that, uh, made sense of the C sharp code and the PowerShell script, Let's go see what we could do with this .NET assembly. Um, 
Let's go ahead and run ILSpy. And let's see what this thing is. I have not opened this. I don't exactly know what I'm going to be looking at. Uh, please pardon all of my malware over on the <laughs> left-hand side of the screen. Let's uh, see what we got. I'm in Edge, uh, .NET Assemblies, All Files. I want this code dom .bytes. Um That should be it. Fingers crossed that will actually let me open it. There we go. Okay, okay. Um, using some things here. I believe it does not have any of the description, title, etc. thing, probably because that's going to be kind of built on the fly. But what is this? References, nothing um, extremely interesting, other than everything that it might be trying to pull in. Uh, the hyphen thing is not useful. Client! Hmm! <laughs> Starting to see some weird stuff in here. Have a class program. Yeah. The main function. So this is probably where we're going to end up being running. Uh, we're checking out the settings delay. Settings delay is set to one, supposedly. That's over in the settings over here. And these are all separated with a strange underscore in the mix. Uh, so if I did thread.sleep to wait just a second for however long the delay is set to, yeah. Settings, initialize settings, exit on the environment, convert to Boolean settings, anti-analysis, so whether or not we are running anti-analysis here. Uh, create mutex, uh, Boolean start block, etc., etc. Prevent sleep, check if admin, clear settings, amsi.bypass. Ooh, that could be fun. While true, we check if we are connected, and then we reconnect... If we are not, that exclamation point right there. We initialize the client to, uh, and reconnect every time if we aren't connected, and then we sleep for five seconds. So that is our main function in the program. What is in the settings here? Oh God. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be fun. If you weren't having fun already, wow. I think this might be the, the crown jewel here. Can we see what else we got to dig out? <laughs> Let's, there's a lot of good stuff in here. So initialize settings takes all this, ooh, with an AES-256 key. Um, and where is that key set? Key is right here. Okay, so we base64 decode that, and then we AES-256 decrypt each of those. So the, these all of these settings are included in base64 representation in the binary, but they are AES-256 encrypted. Uh, but we know the key because that is also stored in the binary. So we could decrypt all of those and try to figure out what each of these things really are. And maybe we could get some really cool data from that. Um, and then we verify hash to just make sure all of that works. Um, I want to go do this. I really, really want to go carve out all of these values because I want to know the hosts and I want to know the ports. But uh, I want to see what the rest of this thing does. We have the client program and settings and we have the client algorithm down below. Looks like that is AES-256 yet again. Ooh, is that actually included? Because that could be... Shoot, yeah, new aes and we're using our own implementation of AES. Uh, it has the key, but it also sets a salt. DC rat by this individual. I really have to think that is some, uh, like, <laughs> claim to fame, right? You're, you're so excited about this rat, this remote access Trojan that you've built. Incredible. Uh, <laughs> what a time to be alive, my friend. We have encrypt and decrypt. Let's all do these unique things. Yeah. Um, I, I should probably do some element of that in C-sharp, but my C-sharp is not all that sharp, not going to lie. Anyway, we just have basic encrypt and decrypt functions and R equal to for this sort of thing. Um, it looks like it's just using vanilla AES-256 though, but it has a salt added in um, with this key length, auth length, etc. So realistically, we should uh, try that in C-sharp. So we'll, we'll play with that in a little bit. But what does our client.connection do? We have an AMSI and 
our AMSI bypass is kind of neat and clever. Uh, if you aren't familiar with AMSI, I don't know if I'll be able to show it to you right now. I don't know if AMSI is even on on my machine. Oh, cool. It is. Fantastic. So uh, say you were trying to run malicious code. Uh, super quick, high level, extreme, superficial explanation of AMSI. Uh, AMSI is the anti-malware scan interface that is brought to life with Windows Defender and more modern Windows operating systems, where if you were to run PowerShell or if you were to run JScript or .NET assemblies or things like that that could be kind of parsed and processed and understood, you could use AMSI. Uh, to look before that thing is ever actually executed to determine does it contain malicious content? Will it be blocked by your antivirus software? So if I were to try and run something like invoke Mimi Cats, invoke Mimi Cats is not a command that I have on the system, uh, but I would have expected to see, oh, that is not a command, right? Not recognized as a command letter function. Uh, however, it's telling me, no, 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 that's malicious content and we're not going to run it even if it were to exist. Uh, so what you could do is you could bypass or break AMSI. Really good examples of this live on AMSI.fail, uh, one of Flangvik's project, another incredible smart fella. Um, and the AMSI scan buffer patch structure that Rasta Mouse had put together, another incredible fella with CRTO and all the good work that he does, it's going to end up patching um, the scan buffer function inside of the AMSI.dll. So if I were to just paste this in and try and run it, Looks like I don't have any errors right away. If I were to try and run the AMSI utils string that I ran previously, AMSI is broken because we've patched out that function. Trying to run invoke Mimi cats, we're not going to get the malicious error that says, hey, this contains malicious content. We're going to get the actual, yo, we don't recognize this because it's not installed. It's not a function. It's not a command line. Uh, with that said, a lot of spooky, scary, malicious programs, evil malware, bad stuff they do AMSI bypasses so they can go and run undetected and not get stopped. Uh, looks like we have some portions of a string in here. So we try to patch. And I'm going to assume this will end up spelling uh, like AMSI.dll. Let's echo that to base64 minus D. Mm, no. Oh, those are the bytes. Yeah, so this is going to be the B8570007 80C3 to eventually return a, a bad uh, function call. Uh, and we would have seen that just previously. Yep, B8570007 80C3. Those are the bytes that are being replaced in the AMSI DLL binary for the AMSI scan buffer function to make that function return its good every single time. And then there it is for base 64, or excuse me, uh, in, in 64 bit rendition. Looks like they just do a simple check there. And then name, process, load library. This has to be AMSI.dll. I would really, really think so. Yep, there it is. Um, and then, of course, AMSI.scan buffer as the function that we want to end up yoinking. I have extra double quotes there. AMSI scan buffer. So this is doing this exact same process still in uh, C Sharp. So even as we ran that in PowerShell, which was still natively calling or, or building up a thing, um, that is how you could do it. <laughs> Sorry, that explanation just fell off the train track <laughs> at the very last minute. Uh, now we have our client socket class and object. Looks like it just defines a whole lot of stuff. And then when you initialize clients, Ooh, we are going to have multiple hosts. We can see that hosts.split and uh, settings for paste bin might be a thing that it could use. Maybe it's exfiltrating or working with paste bin. Checking if it's domains or not. Trying to connect to an address and a port. Then we use a web client to send back and forth. Ooh, yeah. Settings paste bin. Uh, is it using paste bin as like command and control? That's wacky. Oh, sorry. I, I jumped where I didn't want to be because this down here, no, isn't passing a network credential, but I thought it would be. New SSL stream, so it's got to be all encrypted because of the certificate that we would have seen in the settings. Is valid domain, et cetera, boilerplate, read server data. This is just the core of the remote access Trojan functionality. Send and receive functions back in there getting packets and messages, et cetera. 
Um, ooh. Ooh. Can it run some DLLs? No, I don't. I might be scrolling past that way too quickly. Oh, there's a received with some weirdo base 64 in here. Let's check that out super quick. I want to see what this decodes to. Plugin, plugin, invoke? Huh. Received. Cool. Not all that useful. Uh, what do we have for Win32 here? Yep, okay, these are just the things that we're pulling in, our Win32 API calls. Uh, stuff necessary that we saw previously. Load API. Actually, I guess it's from Virtual Alloc. X, a delegate. These are the delegates that it needs, I think. Load library, get proc address, and get delegate for function pointer. So, yeah. And this must be another base64 representation of the string it's doing. I am fading out, if that wasn't clear. I think we should hurry up and get to... Uh, oh, yeah, it's rolling virtual protect. I think we should hurry up and burn through these so that we could actually check out what these settings are because that's going to be the next fun stuff. Actually, I totally forgot <laughs> our anti-analysis functionality. That's also going to be pretty fun to look at. Ooh, check if it's a VM by whim temper. Interesting. And then it will die. It'll kill itself if it is supposedly returning true for is VM by whim temper. That checks Win32 cache memory, get enumerator, move next, get current. So that's WMI right there. I think, I think, is that supposed to be a typo? WMI, Windows Management Instrumentation. That is literally all that that thing does. It just checks if it's in a VM. <laughs> Hey, uh, let's see, can I do that? WMI query, can I run a WMI query in PowerShell? Cause I am on a thing, oh yeah. Get WMI object class win32 process. So I want to use get WMI object. It should really be sim instance for modern stuff. Um, oh, you can just use a query. Cool, let's let's do that. Let's use get WMI object, writing it in the, in the title here, tag query select all from Win32 cache memory. Um, and let's try that on our Windows boy. He is a VM, he is. Um, let's clear this. God dang it, the copy didn't work because I had a, there we go. That did not return anything interesting. So let's say I were to do this on my Windows host. I'm now running Windows on myself here. Let's run this and that will get real values. So that must be some stupid gimmick that it can use to uh, just kind of determine if you're in a virtual machine. Just a simple WMI query. That's really slick. I've actually never seen that before. Maybe there's probably more to it and maybe I'm oversimplifying it like a crap ton, but either way, it's cool. <laughs> Let's get back to our Linux machine. And where were we? We were in IL Spy. We just made sense of this. Anti-process. Ooh. Whoa. It will kill specific processes. Like if it sees task manager open, if it sees process hacker, process explorer, MSASCUI, that's probably a Microsoft tool. If it sees defender or the uh, engine for defender, MPUX serve, MPCMB run, yep, yep. NIS serve, config security policy, MS config, reg edit it'll kill. User account control settings, task kill. It'll kill task kill. <laughs> cool. Wow. All right, we had fun with that one. This is going to be a long video, boys. <laughs> and all the stuff that it's needing to kill process in C Sharp. Slick. What else we got here? Camera. Whoa. Do you just turn on the camera? You literally do. You check if you have a camera and you get filter, filters, filties, filters, you know, monikers. Whoa, take me back. Sorry. 
I also buy drove me somewhere else. Uh, client helper camera. Does this actually turn on? We'll have to do some Googling. Oh, release com object. Yeah, you know, monikers will do it. Maybe it just result add get filter. I am not seeing anywhere that will immediately tell me that that does it or not, but I, I'm not too concerned. Getting the hardware identifier based off the machine name so it kind of knows who its victim is using MD5 crypto service provider. Yep, hashing that in with the loaded library. ID sender, whoa. So this is how it will retrieve all the information. New message pack. Packet, client info, gets the hardware information, gets the user, gets the camera, whether or not it has a camera. Okay, so they must do something else later. Determines antivirus, what's installed, some Pong, some group, whether or not it's an admin or not. Very slick. Just doing some classic fingerprinting. Methods, what do we got on here? This is just checking if it's an admin user or not. Clients on exit. Ooh, here's how we're going to check for the antivirus. Did they just use WMI? Yep, they just use WMI, checking Security Center 2. Uh, Security Center 2 doesn't exist in all versions of Windows, actually. Uh, we've actually been like running into that wall at work. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't exist in... I forget what it is. I forget if it's like what version of Windows, but it, there's one that's just like, hey, I'm not real. I think it might be Windows Server. That might actually be it. On a Windows Server, that like that doesn't, isn't a namespace or a class that you can pull from anymore. Clear settings, get active window title, prevent sleep. Whoa. Never seen that before. Mutex control, probably pretty boring. Native methods, probably pulling in from Win32. Process critical. Uh, oh, does that like, Oh, it makes sure that this is this process is critical? How does it do that? Or like, the BSOD thing makes me think of blue screen of death. Does this just straight up blue screen of death? Because that'd be wacky. <laughs> Software, set value, get value, etc. And registry keys. It probably does some other persistence stuff. Yeah, here we do normal startup with an install function here where we check the environment, install folder, install file based off of the settings and get process. If we are an admin, we go ahead and create a new process with the command prompt and a base64 encoded argument. Let's see what that is. I have a feeling that will add a little bit more persistence. Can I copy this real quick, please? Well, let me paste. Nope, I didn't do it. I'm dumb. How about now? Thank you. Base64 minus D. Scheduled task, create SC on log on highest. What did you call it? What's the name of this? TR, tag N, tag T, and exit. Yeah, task name, scheduled task, creating task name based off of the file name without extension. Huh, would that be app launch? That's kind of curious. Digging through that, we could swipe that away, make sure we get that persistence killed. We also have a new uh, registry key to be added into. We open a sub key from a base64 string. Let's grab this and decode that to see what base64 string or what registry key it might be trying to save to. Let's echo that. Software Microsoft Windows current version run. So just a classic uh, run or auto run, pretty vanilla. But we'll try and write itself to that. Delete itself. Interesting. Mm. We have another batch script that's created. This is a lot of double down. This is like a triple down on persistence right here. We have a temp directory. Timeout three, start CD null. Delete itself. Yeah. All right. Message lib, we don't need to worry about. Let's now go into the lion's den and try and see if we could carve out all of these settings. Yeah? What do you think? 
So I'm going to do this on my host <laughs> because LinkPad is a nice playground for working with C Sharp. And I do want to actually be working with C Sharp here. Uh, let's try and switch this to a C Sharp program. You can define other methods, fields, classes, and namespaces here. Let's just do a, what is it, system.console.writeline. Oh, God, I'm, I'm going to be fumbling back and forth between that, my host and that. Hello world, we could do a please subscribe. Can I just run this with like F5? No? Do you need a semicolon? Yeah. Hello world! Okay, great. So that's our main function. Let's steal all of this. I don't think these all need to be public or static. They do certainly need to exist though. Um, so let's swap that in Python. We'll, we'll set the syntax to C sharp, or excuse me, in sublime text. Let's uh, remove all of the, uh, we're gonna have a lot of these. Let's, let's, let's remove all the new lines because the new lines are gonna get in the way when I try to remove things. Uh, oof, we want new line starting on a new line. Replace that with nothing. There we go. So the server certificate, do we really need to deal with that? I don't want it. I just kind of want the string, not going to lie. Um, we do, however, need AES, and that needs to be defined as a class or object to work with. So let's grab that and put them way up at the top here. Um, and now let's go put that in link pad. Hello? Link pad, please. Thank you. Can I put this all on the top? Yeah, let's just save it somewhere because I'm going to keep accidentally hitting Control S out of, out of habit. <laughs> Will you whine about this? Yes, namespace AES could not be found. I know, I know. We aren't going to worry about that. Okay, cool. So we can create all those variables. Now let's see if we can steal that AES object. That's defined out here as this class. Uh, a lot of these usings I'm going to definitely need, I think. Uh, so if I add those into LinkPad, it does some like voodoo magic. Oh, sorry. Uh, and it tries to like swipe them and add them into the query properties. I just tried to paste that in. So yes, I think. And let's get back to the AES object. We can define that as a class and then just kind of do all this, I guess. Let's steal that code. Make it super easy to find all that. Uh, if I hit run, it's not going to die on me, is it? Nope. Cool. So we've got that class created. Now I should be able to define that AES256 object, and that works just fine. Perfect. So our initialized settings, uh, I really want to be able to see what each of these decode to. Initialized settings will get all of this. Uh, let's do that. Hardware generator, hardware ID, I don't need. Uh, the certificate, I do want to be able to see. So, oh, sorry, I right click that. Let's copy this and kind of mess with it because I am going to want to write each of these out to the screen. So let's do a system.console.writeline. And realistically, we could be doing this in, in links but key colon, and let's just write key. How about that? We don't need the AES displayed, but I do want to see what our ports are. And let's add this in its own separate thing. Because uh, link actually allows you to do a stupid like dump, I think. Dumps? Dump? How do you do it? I don't know. Let's just use system right, right line. Never mind. <laughs> Let's do all the same for hosts. And I, I, sorry, I know this is kind of boring. I do want to get version. I wonder if this is going to end up being the version of this malware strain. Because once this is all said and done, we still have not uh, really done any research yet. We haven't gone to see like, yo, have other, have other people seen this in the wild, out and about? So let's try to do all that uh, as soon as we get all these decrypted. I, I really kind of want to know and see what these each of these things are. And we'll get our own free indicators of compromise. Am I right? You'll be able to see, yo, <laughs> I see the hosts. I see the, uh, I see the ports. 
you can see all the real activity here and whether or not we're going to end up using anti-malware uh, or anti-evasion, stuff like that. Anti-process, we also want to be able to see. I think all of this would be worthwhile to pull out. Blue screen of death, I want to know. Don't need to worry about the hardware ID, uh, but do want to explore the certificate. BSOD, blue screen of death, if that is a thing. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing with group. Super boring. But we are at the end. So server signature, decrypt server signature. Let's do the same. Hello. Grab that one. How you guys doing, everybody? <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. You know, was, you've been a great audience, everybody. <laughs> Let's get server certificate. I don't think that's actually defined. I don't think that ever was defined. Let's just take the certificate and display out the uh, decryption right at the bottom there. Yeah, okay, so this should have a disgusting amount of bad code that I could now slap into our main function, and then it should theoretically do it all. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Nothing. Why? Uh, oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's all right here. It's just not displaying it. It's not displaying the raw bytes. So we have some real strings. Let's take a look at this super quick. Can I, can I just compile this Visual Studio? Let's do it. Let's not use link. Uh, am I on my host? I think I am on my host. Let's go back to Windows virtual machine and then let's use a Visual Studio code in the VM. Create a new project. Um, let's use C sharp. Uh, I don't care. Why do I have to sign in? Are you kidding me? Guess we're going to the host, boys. <laughs> Never mind. That's really stupid. Create new project. I don't freaking care. Just please give me a C sharp .NET framework. Console app .NET Core. I want uh, .NET framework. Console app .NET framework. Go. Test. Please, please, please. And um, oh, I'm going to have to deal with all this crap. Gosh. This isn't a lot, honestly, but I do want to have this class defined up here. In that namespace, I suppose. And it's going to whine because it needs all of those imports which are present in AS256 here. We want to include all these. I hope Visual Studio Code will just straight up do it because you don't need system again, you don't need text again. There, no more errors. Friggin' fantastic, okay. <laughs> um, link probably just wasn't displaying those bytes and I want to see them, so Let's have the thing displayed out. Because uh, we realistically, we could like redirect that to a file and then maybe work with it again in the future or not because it's not important and we don't care. Really, whatever you want. Uh, with that said, we could just compile this and let it do its thing. So let me get back to link. Let's create all these and display them out real quick. I know they aren't used, so you can stop whining. But... Uh, Let's make this a release. Let's compile it for, I guess, any CPU. And we'll control shift B to build this. So delay is assigned but never used. I don't care. It succeeded. It's over in this directory. Sorry, I realize it's pretty hard to see. Uh, but let's open up the PowerShell boy again. Let's hop over there. Let's run that test.exe. The key is going to all be displayed. Oh, and it's just not going to display it. Does it need a string or something stupid? I don't know. Anyway, that was useless. I'm sorry for wasting our time. <laughs> let's get back to our Ubuntu and let's kind of look at this in a, a text editor that doesn't make me hate myself. Ports 5900 on rick63publicvm.com version 1.0.7. Okay. MTX must be the mutex name, DC rat mutex. 
uh, not using paste bin, not using anti-analysis, not using anti-process, not using breach to death. What are we doing? What is, <laughs> is there any reason to do this thing? How about Rick63 at publicvm.com? Are you alive? Do you exist? What if I netcat to 5900? You know what? Let's connect to a VPN first. <laughs> Okay, I have connected to a VPN. Now let's netcat that boy on 5900 just to see. Does he exist? No. How about a curl? A quick HTTP. Oh, sorry. I'm dumb. Nope. Super dead. Did you even have a domain name entry? Oh, you do. Supposedly. Let's do some uh, quick, quick, quick learning, I suppose. I think we've reached the end of the analysis portion. Let's do some quick virus total jams and see what uh, see what everybody thinks about these. Let's do a URL real quick. Let's check out Rick63 Public VM. Mmm, nine vendors are hitting him. Uh, Spam House, Kaspersky, Sirator, Autoshun, Webroot. Nice. Sophos, Fortinet, etc. Cool, cool, cool. How about the IP address? Yeah? Four. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, what does Shodan think about that IP address? How about that? Where do you live, my friend? The Netherlands. Really? Well, okay. Supposedly, previously, before this thing might have been killed. Um, there's some weird stuff going on over there, though. Wow. Uh, weird. HTTP server on 5985? Did I even ping that? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I see. <laughs> um... Quick sanity check. What do you want to do in a public YouTube video, John? <laughs> um, do do you return on 5985? I think that's a fair question to ask. You know, Shodan has already asked the question. Shodan has... <laughs> okay, okay. But 59001 is no longer a thing. Or excuse me, 5900... Is, is no longer a thing. Supposedly. We didn't get a... 59000. Connection. Succeeded. Um. <laughs> and then... And then malware. And then evil. And then atrocities. And then dis disaster and devastation. Um, but... What else would we have a uh, what would would a normal antivirus engine di di discover? Like if I were to try and choose a file to upload, we have our oh showcase and CTF challenge is real there. Uh, we have our original edge update.ps1. Let's see if anyone would get any oddballs out of the original stage zero that we that we first started with here. Uh, needs to uh, look through and do some analysis. Avast is hitting it. Kaspersky's hitting it. Ooh, nice, a decent amount. ESET, Avast, Vera, by This is, okay, this is actually not that bad. 10 out of 55 so far. Ooh, Defender would have hit it on it. 11 out of 58. Good money. PowerShell, Trojan, Dopper. Yeah. I don't know if anyone uh, tracks down what it really could be for a uh, specific, excuse me, malware. Like the malware sort of thing. <laughs> Sorry, just tried to upload the uh, code dom dot bytes uh, to virus total, and that's got a sweet, sweet fifty one out of sixty seven, real bad. <laughs> that's why you hide it. That's why. That's why you. That's why you obscure it with your PowerShell and with your evasion and with all of those obfuscation techniques. That's that's why it's got to be done. Um, this is this is lighting up. Backdoor async rat.net Dr. Webb thinks. Um, 
Cap Mouse. Zemsil F. A lot of good, a lot of good <laughs> potential virus names. Win32 hack undefined. <laughs> cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, that's that's gonna be doing some some suspicious. Oh, there's got a community. Intizer's up in this. Intizer, nice. They reached out and, and came to say hello for a little bit. Hey, Intizer, if you're watching, super appreciate it, guys. Uh, I would love to get back to you, but I kind of need to check in with, you know, the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> Timesbot says it's found in Malshare. Oh, does Malshare have a copy? What does Malshare think that it is? Because, so I gotta be honest, I gotta pull back the curtain a little bit. I, I do have an inkling as to what this is, at least from the stager. Why do you, why do you need a CAPTCHA, Malshare? I am not a robot. Yeah. Okay, you're not telling me anything more. Hits on a lot of Yara, which makes sense. NJ Rat? I don't know. Joe Sandbox is thinking, yep. Oh, nice, nice. They were able to track down and actually see the connection from a day ago. What the heck? So I have to be honest, we found this sample a day ago. But we found it, like, in the wild. <laughs> Uh, that's a different host. That's a different IP address. Yara signatures from Florian Roth and Thor are hitting the same thing that I expected, as this is Snipe 3 encoder, and you can see the references there. Nice. Florian's already got it in the bag. Sorry, I should have zoomed in on that long ago. Florian always has it in the bag. Super smart, dude. AV detection, 43 to 68. 43 to 68. Yep. Cranking. Okay. So, um, was there anything left to explore? Was there anything else to uh, experiment here? Version 107 hosts. That has a different IP address than what the other one was. The certificate and signature, I don't think these actually in include anything worthwhile. Like, if I were to base 64 decode that, yeah, it's just bytes because it's, it's the necessary signature and certificate. I don't think there's actually anything to glean out of that. But there are some interesting strings in there though. <laughs> DC rat server and DC rat by this same fella. Who are you, Quakachon? Quachon Dandin? You have a GitHub account. Sus Washi Monster. What's going on on your GitHub? If I may ask. Slash home. Private. China. Mm. Where am I? <laughs> Got some numbers here. Uh, DC rat. Simple tool written in C sharp. Holy crap. It's just straight up on GitHub. <laughs> so there there are two things at play here I have to say um, this is his site this is his website can I translate it please yeah wow what a nice website not gonna lie do you have any other pictures blogs it takes me to blog what's going on, on the desktop does this take me anywhere Takes me to start. This is weird. This is weird. This is the desktop. Where am I? <laughs> wow. I mean, this looks nice, but I don't know what I'm. I want. I'm. I'm struggling with the language barrier for one thing because I can't read Chinese, and uh, I. I also can't navigate this website <laughs> let's check out what dc rad is doing fixed 23 days ago this is up and at them five months ago three months ago nice nice recent preparation for postgraduate examination did you do this for school <laughs> was this a class homework this is in an action supposedly DC Rat 105. That's the version 105. We saw 107. Yeah? Yeah. TCP connection with certificate validation, or excuse me, verification, stable and security. 
multi-server, multi-port, plug-in system through DLL. Yep, super tiny client. Remote shell, remote desktop, remote camera, registry editor, all of the weird, wacky stuff. <laughs> Live chat, <laughs> modify wallpaper, inject file, open website, DDoS. What a time to be alive. <laughs> Ooh, password recovery, reverse proxy. To do literally everything else that makes it evil. I am not responsible for any actions or damages caused by your use or decimation of the software. You're fully responsible for any use of the software and acknowledge the software is only used for educational and research purposes. You know what? There's a hot topic. You know, there's a hot debate going on, uh, especially in the InfoSec Twitter world, in the <laughs> in the Twitterverse between uh, offensive tooling, whether or not it should be released. Uh I, for one thing, have released offensive tooling. Not at the crazy extent, maybe at some of this cool leech stuff. Hey, donate, donate to my Bitcoin. Donate to my Bitcoin. Let's see. Let me go on a tangent real quick. Bitcoin Explorer. <laughs> what are we doing in this video, everybody? Seriously. Uh, what you got? Bitcoin address, BCH address. Show me. 28 transactions. We got fifteen thousand dollars in that. <laughs> what the fudge? See, you got to take the move of the other malware authors and just write a Bitcoin stealer into your malware, into your rat. <laughs> a lot of these transactions are back um, in June. Though. There's nothing recent, so the dude just me, dude just must be a crypto fan. So. Anyway, I don't mean to be snooping on this guy's GitHub. Obviously, he's got some interesting stuff in here. Uh, a DDoS, <laughs> hidden VNC code. Um, obviously, uh, phishing link, only for Windows 10 solution. I would love to see a little bit more in here. We are going down a rabbit hole. But I just kind of want to do a little bit more digging on what this original malware came from. But I have to say, this is the... Win, at Win 10 exploit? This is the... Um, excuse me. This is the innermost malware that is being ran and executed. Uh, what we saw from the Yara rules triggering in uh, Virus Total and some of Florian Roth notes and, and some of those is that we had ended up tracking down uh, the snipe crypto loader or rat loader uh there's some good inspiration from other rats interesting real-time microphone did anyone else see that let me scroll back down microphone just, just talk to your victims hello <laughs> i've compromised your computer and this is it this is this is this is literally everything that we've just seen except for the plugins <laughs> no no uh. anyway there was a hot topic on twitter as to whether or not people should release offensive tools uh good for doing defensive work to like see what maybe things to be up against uh but only if there's not like if, if there's a proof of concept out, like if it's a zero day exploit, right, you don't want to be just straight up dropping your exploit packs uh, without a patch available. You know what I mean? Without any mitigation, without any work, like stuff. Um, so I'm not... Malware notes. Persistent services. Whoa. Can I convert this into English, please? Because this is a crazy cool resource if you're doing any offensive security red teaming spooky stuff. If I could have this all. Wow. All right. All right. I appreciate things again. I'm distracted and now I think this is neat. Um, I would like this to be in English though I think I can force the translation in some way but there are some 
cool things that could be done with all of these notes, I have to think. Edit on GitHub. Malware note. It is one of his repositories. All right, so we've done enough cyber stalking. <laughs> I, think, I don't think we need to go in any more detail on Quidantian's stuff here. But there was a lot of really, really interesting... 48 repositories. There's so much here. He's on Twitter! Should we drop a follow? He follows me! <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. When you watch this video, um... Uh, <laughs> I... I'm going to go. You know what? I'm going to leave. <laughs> Thank you so much for the support, my friend. You have incredibly cool stuff. Uh, it can be used in the wrong hands. Gentle reminder. I know just as well. I, I, I've had my stuff kind of used to detonate and blow up some, some orgs. Some print nightmare CVEs. Maybe, maybe hand it out to the wrong individuals. Load the repositories, please. Super cool website. Super cool notes. Super cool repositories. Super cool software. Uh, you know, sometimes it can just kind of get... Uh, it's just not loading the repositories tab. So, whatever. Hey, my buddy. This video was for you. <laughs> Um, anyway, let me get to one last thing before we tune out here. Um, you had noticed in virus total, if I still have that open, um, it had d discovered that this looked like snipe or SN one P E, uh, over here, we could see that Intizer had it. Let's check if Intizer actually throws it up, if that's all right. If they can kind of track down, this is the loader here. I think they're calling it in async rat, but we've we've showcased the sync rat before, haven't we? Uh, they have a different executable in memory, but they're thinking it's a sync rat. Yeah. Cool, super cool. Um, Thor, however. And your signature match with Floyd and Roth as Yar rules uh, detected this blog, uh, thinking that this is Snipe, a crypto rat, um, and it loads specific uh, rats like other malicious software. So when we were to go way way back to our edge.update.ps1, when we ran code dom run pe, this projfud.pa was a really interesting string in my mind. Like I didn't. I don't think I'd seen that around before. So if I were to try and Google projfud.pa, not go to it as if it were a website, but actually try and Google this. There we go. We can see a little bit some research. This is Snipe 3 Cryptor, a highly evasive rat loader. It showcases a little bit of other analysis. Um, but Morphosec has one, and that's the same one that was linked in the YAR rule trigger that we saw in Virus Total. Um, this blog showcases a highly evasive rat loader back on back in may may 20 2021 um whoa sorry workers sec has recently monitored a highly sophisticated cryptor as a service that delivers numerous rat families onto target machines uh most delivered through phishing emails which lead to download a visual basic file in some cases however the attack chain starts a large install file such as an adobe installer which bundles the next stage i hadn't seen that before um, but using PowerShell with remote sign perimeter, we did validating the existence of windows sandbox or VMware virtualization. I don't know if that's just doing the simple VM analysis that we did by checking for that WMI class, but it, we thought we saw paste bin being used. I feel like that was more strictly in the DC rat from our, our fellow on GitHub though, but snipe cryptor uses some of these, yeah. So it could use a custom rat like Async Rat, Revenge Rat, Agent Tesla, and other things that we've showcased in, in different videos. But um, starts with PowerShell script or uses Visual Basic script. 
does some fileless neato bonito things, just as we saw. It compiles run PE, which is kind of the same variable that we saw, executes it as it's decompressed with gzip and gets C sharp code, runs with .NET, and continues, right? Classified this as crypt or activity. First stage is Visual Basic script. Uh, there are a couple different variations. Now, we had not started with the Visual Basic script. We started to the second stage PowerShell script. Maybe that's just how, how we found it. Maybe I didn't track down or haven't seen where this original VB script could have came from. Uh, but I think this is just for version one, or there are different variations of how this could be delivered, right? There's top, top, or top for top. And then that could extract this out, have the key, eventually return more PowerShell. Ooh, that's really interesting. The following table describes different subversions that we've observed when the save PowerShell name is winupdater32.ps1, always a capital .ps1, um, and ours is called edge updater. So, did they have a did they have a notion of this just as well? Here's the PowerShell script. Here's the stream that they might have loaded from Pastebin. Here's the VBS run inside of the install function. Same thing that we saw. And then they use IEX to fire this thing up. So version four that we've seen recently, very similar to version three, except the author has replaced the obfuscation techniques and attempt to discard known IOCs from the previous version to avoid detection. Different names of the VB script variables, saves and executes a batch script that it contains a PowerShell script using get object instead of create object. Another subversion implements a decryption PowerShell. Uh, hadn't seen that one. But virtual machine detector is all being used within PowerShell. That I hadn't seen before. Detect sandbox that we hadn't seen before either. But when it executes a rat, here, there's nine cat rat, which we've seen previously. And they're using that code dumb functionality, doing the exact same execution uh, setup that we had. Oh, and they're using the binary to string in the PowerShell. Interesting. Ours was obfuscated in a different way. They use the bytes thing here, but they aren't using the URL encoded rendition. The third stage is rat payloads. They're showcasing NyanCast rat or async rat for that one. Um... Let's see if they have any different uh, C2 users or C2 for, for what they've seen. I don't think anyone has showcased DC rat from this new thing. VB script names. Do we include the PowerShell names? Because I would like to see one of those. I do not see them. There we go. The unique artifact that we found is a run PE source code namespace and class names projfud.pa. Projfud in that DLL, it's embedded as a pre-compiled DLL. That gives us a PDB of users snipe as his name, SN1P3. Oh, right there. OneDrive Bureau Sparta project, sus. With the following PDE spring, we discovered additional variants we believe are from the same author due to repeating patterns within the code flow. Here are some examples. CS Clipper, Deep Cryptor, Whack. But that is that. That is the Snipe Cryptor, or SNP3, however you want to call it. Different hashes, different indicators of compromise. We've uh, uploaded ours to VirusTotal. A second stage PowerShell delivery URLs. We did not have that present. Ours was embedded in batch script hashes in version four, rat payloads. So I have to think, rat C2 domains, none of these are what we've seen. This has to be maybe a version five. You know, maybe it may be a new version because they aren't showcasing the URL encoding one. When they get to version four from April uh, of this year. Now they're showcasing the load in PowerShell with different uh, structure. They, they were either using an IEX 
previously for version three, and now version four was using some other implementations that would just include it as character codes. Right here. Decompress. And ours was URL encoded. So, gotta be something new, which is whack. <laughs> All right, that's enough. That was has been a long, long ride and took significantly longer than what I would have expected or wanted, but I think there was a really cool stuff in that. I hope you enjoyed. I don't think there's much more to go down. We know that this is the Snipe 3 rat or loader. We know that the eventual rat was DC rat server by our boy here. Dan, um, thanks for the follow on Twitter, I guess. <laughs> and this has been an absolute roller coaster, starting from our simple edge update.ps1, digging through PowerShell to C Sharp, a little bit of Visual Basic script in there with IL Spy and all of these things, and doing our homework and research. So, boy, oh boy, I think that was a fun one. I don't know about you. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do all those YouTube algorithm things. If you could like the video, I would super appreciate that. Leave a comment. Please subscribe. Hit the bell. Do all those things. Um, I am trying to grow a little bit more of a Twitch audience. So if you'd like to see more of this content, you can follow or subscribe on Twitch. I stream nightly as often as I can, very late at night. I'm also trying to grow the whole Twitter thing, you know, uh, if it wasn't obvious. <laughs> um, just anywhere. I'd love to have you keep track of uh, all the content, all the stuff that I'm doing. And I super appreciate all the support. Patreon and PayPal in the description if you're up for that. So, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go check out Sneak. I think there's a promo attached to this video just as well. I love you. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. With the